Psalms 103. I want to uh, try to teach a very important truth this morning, one that I'm afraid uh, we miss and sometimes uh, we, we forget about. And this is uh, really a serious warning for all of us. And so I, I hope this will uh, be a help and be clear. There's so much scripture, so many examples I'd love to give. We, just, we don't have time. There's so much scripture on this that I'm afraid sometimes we just uh, ignore, you know, the Bible says we're supposed to meditate on the scriptures and I don't think we do enough of that. I don't think we sit and ponder the things of God enough. And, uh, we just often read through the Bible quickly and especially a lot of what we uh, could learn from this subject. We learn in stories in the Bible and in examples in the Bible, a lot of the stories in the old Testament, the Bible teaches in the new Testament that all those stories in the old Testament, you know, they were written for our admonition. We're supposed to be learning from these stories and the way we see how God dealt with things in the old Testament, those are supposed to be reminders and warnings for us. And so I, I want to re start reading in Psalms chapter 103, verse one, it says, bless the Lord. O my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name, bless the Lord. O my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. I want you to notice the several references we're going to see to God's forgiveness and his mercy. All right. Very important. I think we all know about that. Uh, hearing about God's forgiveness and mercy is something that, you know, pretty common. I mean, even, you know, Joel Osteen will talk about God's forgiveness and God's mercy. And God is very forgiving and God is very merciful. And it's highlighted in this passage. And it's important that we understand that we could talk about the mercies of God. I mean, they are great. And we'll see some of those scriptures. Let's keep reading says, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. Look at this. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. Uh, that's another great promise. I mean, and uh, a wonderful promise. Thank God that he is those things, that he is slow to anger. I mean, plenteous in mercy. But look at verse 9. It says, He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Okay, now that's another encouraging verse there. So first we see verse 8, you know, very encouraging. Lord is, I mean, merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenty of mercy. But then the next verse, that isn't really exciting. It says, he'll not always chide. He's not always going to fight with us on these things. You know, it's, there actually is a limit. Sometimes when we get to talk about the attributes of God, you know, we can actually go too far on some of these things. And I'm afraid when it comes to God's mercy and his forgiveness, we sometimes take it even farther than God does. Cause while he is merciful, while he's got a ton of it, while he's gracious, the Bible says he will not keep his anger forever. In other words, there is a limit. You can go too far. It, it makes it very clear. But then in verse 10, okay, well, how far is it? Okay, because there's plenty of people that I would say, you know what, they've gone too far. It's about time God deals with them, right? But here's the thing. It says, he hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Now, that's encouraging, but at the same time, it's kind of scary too, because it's like, well, wait a minute. I'm not getting what I deserve. A lot of Christians, they have this messed up mentality that the blessings that you're receiving, that you're getting them because you deserve them all. You think the goodness that God is showing you, it's because you've earned it, because you deserve it. No, God does not give us what we deserve. We do receive blessings, but that's what mercy is. When, when you do, you know, for, there's a difference between forgiveness and mercy, okay? If you do something to me that's bad and you deserve to get payback and I don't give you payback, that's called forgiveness. I didn't give you what you deserve. But mercy is if when you deserve bad, I do good to you. I, I give you a blessing. That's what mercy is. Okay, God is forgiving. He doesn't give us what we deserve, but then he's merciful. He gives us good things that we don't deserve. Okay, so understand all of us in here that we are under God's grace and mercy. God is good to us, not because we deserve it, 
but because He is good and because He's merciful, because He's gracious, and we should never make the mistake of mistaking God's mercy for us being deserving of something. Okay, that's a, that's a dangerous attitude because there is there comes a point where mercy is going to run out, where we can push God too far. Look what it says in verse uh, twelve. It says, as far as the or, uh, verse eleven, for as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is His mercy toward him that fear Him. It, it's it's big. It's high. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgression from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. Remember what God told Adam after he sinned in the garden and God cursed him? You know what God said? For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. God remembers that. God understands that we're human, that we're weak, that we fail. And so God's merciful to us because of that. And thank God for that. And so it says in verse 15, As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it and is gone, and the place whereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments, and do them. So right here we see just a great passage about God's forgiveness, his graciousness, his mercy. It's one of the great attributes of God, but people often forget about the warning in there that says he will not always chide with man. There God will only allow you to go so far, but what's kind of scary about this, we don't know how far God's going to let us go. We don't always know when we've pushed God too far. And so we do, we love talking about God. You know, we love talking about his love and mercy. We often sing about the mercies of God. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. You know, we rejoice in the fact that he's a loving and a forgiving God who will abundantly pardon. The Bible uses that term. But sometimes I, I'm afraid we get overzealous about God's mercy and forgiveness. And you know, and so we start making claims and promises that God never made. And you'll hear people sometimes, they'll read these verses and they'll get, get real excited and then they'll start making claims to people that God never really made. As though there is no line that you can cross. That is not what the Bible teaches. That there, you know, that y- you can push God too far. It is too late. For some people, and I'm going to show you the scriptures on that. And in this passage here, that is a beautiful passage about the forgiveness and mercies of God. It specifically mentions that, that, you know, there is a limit. You can go too far. He's not always going to chide. Neither will he keep his anger forever. Okay. I believe there's been many times, maybe even right now, where God has been angry with me and he is not, he's, but he's kept that anger. He's, you know, he said, I'm going to be merciful. I'm going to forgive. I am not going to give him what he deserves right now. But you know what? I'm thankful for that. But once again, if I keep pushing and I keep pushing and I keep pushing, eventually God's going to say, you know, enough's enough. I'm dropping the hammer on him. You know, punishment is coming. And so we've got to be careful about this. We can't, we're not allowed to make claims about God that God never made about himself. And we do that often when it comes to the subject of God's mercy. You know, preachers, they make, they're making claims about God that God never made. We have no right to do this. And so I'm afraid when it comes to the mercies of God, many preachers, they've gone too far and are actually emboldening people to continue sinning. It's like they think, hey, you know, it's never too late to come back. Hey, the prodigal came home. The prodigal, he was in the hog pen, but he still came home. But here's the problem with that too. The parable of the prodigal son was not about backsliders returning. It was about Gentiles receiving salvation. And, but people often will take that story and make applications for it that God didn't even make. And they'll start making claims that God didn't make and actually are emboldening people to just go ahead and sin. Hey, it's never too late. You can always come back. You can always get out of the consequences of your sin. And that's just not the case. There comes a point when God will eventually say, enough's enough. And He's done it before and He'll do it again. Go back to Genesis chapter 6. Look at what it says in Genesis chapter 6. 
and verse 1, And it came to pass when men began to multiply in the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is flesh. Isn't that similar to what we saw in Psalms 103? I will not always chide, neither will I keep my anger forever. And God looked at man and he said, you know what? My spirit's not always going to strive. I'm not going to continue fighting them, which means God was fighting them. God was warning them. God was trying to stop them from the wickedness. God was being merciful. God was being gracious. God was being slow to anger. God was doing everything he promised that, you know, or that he said he was going to do in Psalms 103. He, he, was, he had, he had done, already done all that stuff. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Back then, God was acting exactly the way He says He will act later when He uh, mentioned it in Psalms chapter 103. But He said, I'm always going to strive with man for that He also is flesh, yet His day shall be 120 years. God said, you know what? They've got 120 years left. 120 years, and I'm going to destroy this world with a flood. That was what God said. I'm done. I am done striving with man because he's flesh. You know, and we do, we're so arrogant. We think that we have this right to just rebel against God, rebel against his word. And it's interesting because in this case, he said, you know, he's flesh. Why am I fighting with these people? But then in Psalms, you know, he remembers that we're dust. You know, he's like, you know, they are a flawed people, but I love them anyway. But I'm still, I'm not going to keep my anger forever. And so God said 120 years and man's done, but Noah, we see in the Bible, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God ended up sparing Noah because he was the one righteous man. God spared his family and the human race continued through Noah, but God sentenced man to 120 years and he said, I'm done. It's too late. It's too late. 120 years. And you know what? That flood game and it killed all of them. But you know, under, no, but notice and there's a million examples I can give like this in the Bible. God declared they're done for. They've crossed the line. But it took 120 years before that judgment was carried out. And keep that in mind because we're going to see some things later. Often when people cross a line, it is sometimes years and years and years before the consequences come. And we, that's something that ought to scare us a little bit. Because like, hey, have I crossed any lines? You know, have, have, I, have I done that yet? You know, we don't always know when we cross that line. And so th these things, they ought to cause us to fear God. And it's okay to fear God. We're going into Halloween where everybody's wanting to be scared of stuff. And the stuff they want to be scared of is stuff that's not real, stuff that's fake, stuff that's stupid. And we ought to be fearing God. That's what we ought to be about. But there is, there's a day coming where God's going to tell the world enough's enough. That day is called the day of the Lord. It says in Jude chapter 1 and verse 14, um, it says, And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Our world that we live in today is wicked and it seems like the world's getting away with it. You know why it seems that way? Because God is gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. But one of these days, God's going to say, enough's enough. And he is going to pour out his wrath on this world. That day is coming. You know why? Because there is a limit to God's mercy. You can only push him so far and God's going to say, enough's enough. Judgment is coming and there's nothing you can do about it. It is too late. And that, and so that day is coming. It's called the day of the Lord. And there's, so we see in the example of Noah and the flood, there was a time when mankind in general, God said enough's enough, 120 years. A day is coming where God's going to say to man in general, enough's enough. Judgment's coming. My wrath is going to be poured out on you. But you know what? There's a day for individuals too. For even for individuals, there's a day when God is going to say enough is enough. And a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people get upset with that. And they'll start, uh, you know, there, there is a great white throne of judgment coming. Revelation 20, we talked about it in Sunday school a little bit, where the people are going to be judged according to their works. And the Bible says they are going to be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. That is coming for all those who are lost, where God's going to say enough's enough. 
and they're going to be cast into hell. Because see, sit, you know, remember, God is a just God. It mentioned that in Psalms chapter 103. God is a just God. He is a holy God. He is a righteous God. He is going to execute righteousness and sin has to be dealt with. It has to. God can't just let things go. Have you, you know, as parents, sometimes you just, have you ever just got, you know, I'm tired of punishing my kids. You know, I, I'd, I'd like to just let this go, <laughs> you know, but sometimes, you, you know, you can't do that. You got to deal with stuff. And you know what? God is a holy God. He's going to, he's got to deal with sin. And for a believer, our sin was dealt with on the cross, wasn't it? Thankfully, Jesus Christ, he paid for the sins of the world on the cross, but it only benefits those who will believe on him. Correct. Only those who believe receive that forgiveness. If you don't accept Jesus's payment on the cross, then guess what? You get to pay for your own sins and it's going to take you an eternity in hell to do it. And so, because God has to deal with sin. And if we won't accept that free gift of salvation, we have to pay for our sins ourselves, and it's going to take us all eternity. So for the unbeliever, they'll deal with it for eternity in hell. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. All right, but we've all sinned, so we all get death, right? Well, Jesus tasted my death for me. Jesus died for me. I've accepted his gift, and so I don't have to pay that penalty. But those who reject that gift, they will pay for that. They will pay for their sin because God is a holy God. Sin has to be dealt with. And so people do. They try to make this claim that there is no limit to God's mercy. You know, they'll read those verses about the mercy and they'll skip, you know, they'll skip over the ones where it talks about the limits and they'll say there is no limit to God's mercy. And some people will get mad at me for saying there is. Oh, you're putting limits on God. Listen, I'm not the one that put it on him. He put it on himself. Because understand, while God is merciful, God is holy and God is just too. God has to deal with sin. If he doesn't deal with sin, he's not a holy God. And he is a holy God. And we, and we, can't, and we can't change that. And so they try to make that claim, but that, that's not what the Bible teaches. And, he, and you know, proof of that, does God forgive people after they die? Think about that. So obviously there's a limit, right? I mean, all these people in hell, do you not think they're asking for forgiveness right now? But are they getting forgiveness? Absolutely not. What do you think all those people are going to be doing at the great white throne of judgment in Revelation chapter 20? They're going to be asking for forgiveness, but it will be too late. Correct? So obviously there's a limit, right? After someone's dead, at least for sure. I, th I think everybody would agree with that. There's a limit. And, you know, and, and, you know, when that's, well, you know, after you die, it's too late. But as long as you're breathing, there is no limit to God's mercy. But the problem with that, you know, you know, and so, you know they'll say he's limited, you know, or it's, it's, it's unlimited to those who are living. But, you know, they'll say as long as you're alive, there's still hope. But you know what? There's no scripture that says that. Nobody can ever show you a scripture that says that. In fact, let me show you some that say the opposite. Look at Proverbs chapter 29. We'll see several of these in Proverbs. You know, and this, this, what I'm preaching right now, it's not popular today, but when I was growing up, this was preached all the time. In fact, you could not go to a youth conference or a youth camp where this verse that I'm about to read did not get preached. And that is Proverbs 29 verse 1 that says, He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Y'all see that? Being off reproved. You've been corrected over and over again, and you've hardened your neck. You've been stubborn. The Bible said you'll be destroyed, and that without remedy. I heard that preached all the time. But you know what they're getting in youth conferences today? I went to two youth conferences in a row, and they was, these were in kind of the trendy churches, and both, in both of them, guys got up and they preached about that story about Elisha when the kids, the little children... We're mocking his bald head and the two she bears came and killed all of them, like 42 children or something. And they're all like, now these weren't young children. These were, you know, probably like young adults, you know, like, but still living at home, 17, 18 year olds. And I'm just like, it says little children. That means they're not full grown, all right? You know, these are probably, you know, prepubescent kids at least. It says little children. But why? Oh, that's so mean. I mean, they're little kids. You know, little kids are innocent. They can't help it if they're cursing a man of God. No, these, obviously these kids were from some horrible homes if they were treating 
an old man like that. I'm telling you, I, I would hope I'd never see some little kid around here, you know, mocking some old man or some old lady. We're supposed to respect the elderly. And that is wicked. And you know what? That kind of thing does go on with little kids today because our world is wicked. They're not taught respect. And, you know, kids who would do that, little kids like that, they're going to grow up to be wicked adults too. And so, you know what? Yeah, God let that happen. Elisha himself, he cursed those children and those bears came and killed them. And everybody's trying to soften things up today. And I'm, I'm hearing all these preachers are coming up with these, you know, they're, they're, you know, softening up all these stories in the Bible. That is not what went on when I was a kid. I constantly heard, he that being off or proven, suddenly destroyed, or, you know, hardened his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. You kids better stop rebelling. You better start listening to what the Bible says. One of these days, God's going to say enough's enough and your life is going to be destroyed and there'll be no return. I heard that all my life. Nobody's teaching that today. It's all about, no, you can always come back. It's all, you know, it's all good. You can't go too far. Doesn't matter how perverted. It doesn't matter how wicked. You can always come back and we're like emboldening people to sin. And they're telling these kids at youth conference and they're thinking, yeah, you know, I, I know I'm not supposed to experiment in this stuff. I know I'm not supposed to be, you know, messing around and fornicating or, or experimenting with homosexuality and stuff. But, you know, I'll try it. I can always come back. No, there's some things you can't come back from. There's some things that there is no remedy for. It says that right there in Proverbs chapter 29 in verse 1. It says in uh, Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 22. Turn over there. You're, not, you're really not going to like this passage. It says, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity and scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and ye have your fruit and ye have refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. So they're not listening. I'm reproving you. I'm trying to correct you. You're ignoring me. And what does he say? I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and shall be filled with their own devices. Y'all see that right there? That's pretty clear. And yet people are being taught today, you know, go, you know, you, if you try all that, you know, no, it doesn't matter what you do, what you try, what you experiment, you can always come back. No, if there's some things you will never, ever recover from. There are some things that just have fatal consequences. Psalms chapter two and verse one. And this is a prophetic Psalm here. This is something that's talking uh, about the future. It's referred to in the new Testament. This is talking about, I believe it's talking about Jesus Christ says in Psalms chapter 2, verse 1, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall He speak unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. It's talking about, you know, God, one of these days when He's pouring out His judgment on this world, He's not crying, He's laughing. Oh, that, that's awful mean. Not really. After all God has done, after all that He has given us, after all His warnings, after all that we've rejected and just spit in His face, the way we have, in our country, the way we have perverted everything, we have taken sacred institutions that God has given us, like marriage, and we have perverted it into something. You don't think that God is... You know, why would God not judge us for that? God has given us, you know, children, and yet we can abort them in this country. And we, and we know better than that, and we have just rejected these things. We j reject clear truth. And one of these days, God's going to pour His judgment out on this earth. He's going to pour His judgment out of this country. And you know what? People are going to be saying they're sorry then, but you know what He's going to do? He's going to laugh at them. It's too late. You've gone too far. 
You'll never hear Joel Osteen preach about that. You'll never hear him you know, read from that passage. But that is what the Bible teaches. It's right there. And we've got to be careful about telling people there is no limit. You can always come back. We need to warn people there are some things you should never do. There are some places you should never go. There are some things that you should never try. People you should never listen to because it will destroy you. And the thing is, when it comes to this destruction, okay, one of the things we see in the Old Testament, we see it's very clear. You know, like, well, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. All these verses you're given is Old Testament. And you're right, it is Old Testament. But once again, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But in the New Testament, we learn some new things. We learn new things about God that we didn't know before. Okay, God hasn't changed, but we learn new things about him in the New Testament. Well, you know what we learn in the New Testament? Is that one of the ways that God destroys us, one of the ways that he destroys us without remedy, it's not like, you know, you hear the stories of, you know, the people that rejected God and, you know, they ended up, you know, killing themselves and are miserable or in prison. You know, you, 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 we've all heard the dramatic stories, right? Especially the teenagers. They hear those at the youth conferences and things. Don't ever try this because this is what happened to this person. But actually, you know what the Bible teaches happens to people who are off reproved, hard in their neck, the way they're destroyed. The Bible teaches in Romans 1 that God just gives them over to a reprobate mind. God, what God ends up doing, God ends up changing their mind to where, you know, things that most of us would be repulsed by and wouldn't do, they now have a desire to do those things. And why does God want it? So they will be destroyed. So they, so they will not call nor because the Bible says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But there are some people God doesn't want them calling on the Lord. And everyone agrees a person can't get saved without the drawing of the Holy Spirit. And, and the, and the Holy Spirit, he's not going to speak to these people. They've crossed the line. God's given them over to a reprobate mind. We see in the book of revelation after Jesus Christ returns and God starts pouring his wrath out. What the Bible says, they blasphemed the lamb. They blasphemed him. They knew it was Jesus. When Jesus Christ returns, the Bible says every eye is going to see him. They're going to know who is pouring their wrath out. But the Bible never says they repented of their deeds. It never says they called on the Lord. It says they blasphemed. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit has quit speaking to these people. The Holy Spirit has quit drawing these people because it is time for destruction. They waited too long. The Bible says God will send them a strong delusion that they will believe a lie that they all might be damned because they believed not the truth and had pleasure and unrighteousness. What, what does that mean? They went too far. And these people are still breathing, but God has said, enough's enough. I'm not, I'm not going to let you push me anymore. You're done for. But here's the thing. These people, many of the people who are done for, okay? Many of these people who we would call the reprobates, all right? These people that you see at marching in the gay pride parade, okay? A lot of these people, a lot of them are miserable. A lot of them are on drugs. A lot of them are, you know, going to commit suicide within the year. Okay? It's just, that's just statistical facts right there. But you know what? I believe some of them are happy. I believe some of them are even enjoying their life. You know Why? Because God has given them over to a reprobate mind to do those things that are not convenient. Because if these people had a normal mind, you know what they would do? They would say, this is horrible. This is wrong. This is perverted. I need to ask for God's forgiveness. But if they would do that, God would forgive them. They would be saved. But God said, no, these people crossed a line. They were often approved. They hardened their neck. They're going to be destroyed. And that without remedy. And we've, we've got to understand that. And so people, they'll try to use the Apostle Paul as proof that it's never too late for anyone to get saved. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is the passage they'll use. But let me show you something in this passage that people uh, often fail to recognize. And this is, this is important. It says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and injurious. But I obtained mercy. Why did he obtain mercy? It says, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners 
of whom I am chief. He was the worst of all sinners, and yet God forgave him. But notice what it says there. It says he did it ignorantly in unbelief. Okay, now here's the, here's the thing we need to understand about sin. Sin is sin whether you know it's sin or whether you don't know it's sin. God, uh, God considers all sin sin. And if a person does not know they're sinning, it's still sin. But it is a bigger deal to God when a person sins knowing that they're sinning. Let me show you some verses on that. In the Apostle Paul, he was being zealous of his religion. When he was killing Christians, he thought he was doing the work of God. He was very sincere. He sincerely thought he was doing the work of the Lord, killing Christians. That's how ignorant he was. But thank God... When God showed him that he was wrong, he quit. He got saved. And there are many people today, they know they've done wrong. They know what they're doing is wicked. They have been corrected by God. The Holy Spirit has spoken to them. They've been corrected by a preacher or parents. They've been corrected by the scriptures, but they've said, you know what? I don't care. Paul didn't do that. And that is a big deal when you do that. It says in Acts chapter 17 in verse 30, and the times, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but com now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That was referring to this time when people were worshiping idols ignorantly. Paul is preaching right here to an idolatrous people. And Paul is telling them here that, hey, there was a time when God, he kind of, he winked at that. A there was a, a time when they were ignorant of it. And so God was merciful. God didn't destroy them right away. He didn't save them from it. But you know what? God, he, he winked it. But you know what? That's not the time anymore. Jesus Christ had died on the cross. The gospel was going out all over the whole world. And God said, you know what? I'm not ignoring this anymore. These nations that are worshiping idols, they better get saved. They better repent of that or they will be destroyed. They will suffer. Listen, our country today, it's, it's wicked, but we have no excuse for our ignorance anymore. We've got Bibles everywhere. There are churches everywhere. There is no excuse for us to be as wicked as we are in this country. There is no excuse for any place in the world to be as wicked as they are today. And at the time of this ignorance, the Bible says God winked at, but you know what? People know better now. The gospel has gone around the whole world. Has, I mean, obviously some places rejected it, but the gospel went there. And so they are now accountable for these things. And so when a person sins, it's a sin even if you don't know it's a sin. There are people today that are just never been taught any better. They're living in fornication and they don't even know it's wrong. God still sees that it's wrong. They still are suffering judgment because of that lifestyle. But at the same time, I believe God will be more merciful to that person than a Christian young person who grew up in church and lives that kind of life. Because they know better. They were often reproved. And so, there is. There's a huge difference. And it's a big deal when we sin willfully. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. When we know something is good and we don't do it, it's a sin. Well, what does that mean? Well, a person who maybe doesn't know to do good. And they don't do it. You know, it's not a sin. I think it'd be safe to say that. Okay. And so, you know, once again, there's a diff difference here. Because obviously sin is sin for anyone. But there are some things, you know, that just good things that we should do. You know, doing nothing is not necessarily transgressing the law. But God knows we should do these good things. And when we know that and don't do it, it's a sin. So some people are ignorant. They're not doing good things because they don't know any better. But when you have a knowledge, there's a difference. God holds you to a higher standard. God expects more from you. And so that goes along with those who are often reproved. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Okay, back in the Bible days, in the Old Testament, there were certain sins, if you committed them, you would go and you would offer a sacrifice. They would have a specific sacrifice. You'd go do this with a priest or whatever, and that would take care of it. But listen, Jesus Christ made the final sacrifice. Jesus Christ took care of all that. We don't sacrifice animals or anything anymore. And after you get saved, okay, you've been saved by the sacrifice that Jesus did on the cross. And if you go and you sin willfully, there is no sacrifice that you can do to make up for that sin. You know what? Now you're under the chastening hand of God. 
because no more sacrifice for sins. So, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. So, you know, he that despised Moses law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite under the spirit of grace. Y'all see that? He said, it, if it was bad for them, think of how much it's worse it's going to be for you who knew the truth and you've trodden it underfoot. I mean, that is a huge deal. And we need to take, we need to take that stuff serious. It is a big deal when we know the truth. It says in, um, I uh, lost my spot. Romans chapter one in verse 18. I referred to this a little while ago, but it says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. These people that God gave over to a reprobate mind, these were people that knew the truth and they rejected it. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. So understand, when you know the truth and you reject it, when you've been corrected, when you've been reproved, and you harden your neck, there comes a point where God says, enough's enough. Mercy is over. Judgment is coming. And so the Apostle Paul, yeah, he did some horrible sins, but God was merciful because he didn't know any better. And there is, we've got, we've got a wicked culture. We've got a wicked society. People do some pretty wicked things. And you know what? I believe God will save these people. Many of them are just ignorant. They're suffering for their sins. Their existences that they live are pretty miserable. But there is, there's a difference between a person out there who commits certain sins and someone in here who commits certain sins because we know better. And so, um, look what it says in 1 Peter chapter 4. Christian, even Christians, we're not exempt from earthly punishment just because we're saved. 1 Peter 4, 14 says, If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their party is evil spoken of, but on your party is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. Okay, sometimes we suffer as a Christian for doing the right thing, but God said, or Peter said, don't let anyone suffer for evil. Because if you're a Christian and you do the wrong, you're going to suffer for it. There is going to be judgment for that. We are not exempt just because we are saved. And so, uh, you know, because Jesus, our high priest, lived a life on earth as a man, he understands what we're up against. Okay? He understands what we're dealing with. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Y'all see that? God knows what's going on in our mind. He knows what's going on in our heart. God knows. It. I don't know that. No one else in here knows that. Only God knows that. Then he says, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You're not going to hide anything from God. Okay? He knows. Verse 14, seeing then that we have this a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So listen, this we can take this verse two ways. We can take it as very encouraging, but it can also be scary. It's encouraging because you know what? God does know what we're dealing with. He does know what we're up against. He understands our challenges. He understands what we face. And because of that... He is merciful to us. He is gracious. But understand, because God knows that, because everything is naked, everything is open in His eyes, God knows when we're taking advantage. God knows when we're ignorant, and God knows when we're just being rebellious. He knows it. And listen, we've all been there before when we were kids. Where, you know, Even as adults, we know when we're doing wrong, don't we? We know, and remember when you were a kid, when you, you'd try to get away, you'd test your parents sometimes, wouldn't you? 
you'd see how far you could push things. You'd see how far, you know, you could you could get before trouble came. And then you would always make that decision, is it worth it? You know, sometimes my sisters, it was just like, if I do this, I know I'm going to get spanked, but you know what? I think it might be worth it, you know? And, and you never, I never told my parents that, you know, because I, they would make sure it wasn't worth it, okay? But at the same time, you know, it, it, was, it was willful. It was willful disobedience. I knew exactly what I was doing. And understand that God knows our hearts. And there are sometimes people, they are, they're taking advantage. They're being flat out rebellious. They know what they're doing is wrong. And God sees that. And we can get to a point where God says, enough's enough. And the scary thing about this is that when we cross that line, I don't see in the Bible where God tells us that we did and God brings a hammer out right away. See, God forces us into a situation again where we have to have faith. Because think about it this way. If every time we send, you know, some type of supernatural thing happened to us, then why would we obey God? We would obey God so those supernatural bad things wouldn't happen to us, right? You know, if every time you sinned, an anvil dropped out of the sky and it landed on your head like on Looney Tunes or something, you know, yeah, I'm not going to sin because I don't want that anvil to fall on my head. But God wants us to obey Him in the Spirit. God wants us to have faith. And so God has warned us. He's told us, don't do these things. There's judgment. There's a line you can cross that there is no return for. But God does not tell us when that happens. So you know what? It leaves us every day wondering, do I sin? You know, have I crossed the line? Will this sin be crossing the line? Or, you know, because that's the thing. If we knew where the line was, what would we do? We would all walk up to the line, wouldn't we? And God doesn't want us doing that. God wants us walking in the Spirit. He wants us doing the right thing. So He doesn't tell us when it is. And when a person crosses the line and it's too late, God doesn't tell us that it was too late. Because what would we do? We would try to run back to the other side of that line, wouldn't we? We would try to act like, you know, it's like kids. You catch them red-handed sometimes. You know, they're supposed to be in bed or something. And then you go walking out of the room. And what do you see them do? You see them run right past you into their room real fast. Hey, I saw that you disobeyed me, all right? You know, you think because you just ran and jumped in your bed, all this, I'm going to act like, oh, yep, they never, they, they were in the bed the whole time. <laughs> Not that stupid. And that's what, that's what we would do too. But when we cross that line, God doesn't tell us. And He's going to let us go on to destruction. And we see that all over the Bible with King Saul. He was only a few years into his reign when God said, enough's enough. You're not going to be the king anymore. God repented that he had made Saul king. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago in Sunday school. And then Samuel said, he's removing you from being king and he will not repent. He is not as a man that he should repent. And it's like, wait a minute. God already said he repented. Here he's saying he's not going to repent. What he was saying is he's not, he is not going to change his mind about this. He's not going to be like man. Okay, Have you ever done that to your kids before? You're getting spanked when we get home. And then later you're like, ah, fine. Forget it. You know what you did? You repented of, of the judgment you pronounced on them. When God pronounced judgment, He does not repent of it like a man does. And that's what He was talking about there with Saul. He's like, God's not changing His mind on this. You're not going to be king. There is no coming back for you, Saul. And it wasn't until years later when Saul was finally killed, when Saul was finally destroyed, when he received what was pronounced on him, and you know what? There's a lot of people that are walking the streets today and they're walking and even sitting in churches today that they've already crossed the line. That it's only a matter of time and judgment is going to be upon them. And unfortunately today, many, you know, many Christians, because once again too, God wants us to obey Him for the right reason. Okay, And if, if, if God just killed everybody right away, okay? You know, if Brother John rebels and then all of a sudden a lightning bolt comes out when he goes outside and strikes him and he dies, we're all going to be like, oh, I'm going to obey God now because I saw him get hit with a lightning bolt. But God wants us to obey by faith. And so we might see Brother John doing all these horrible things that a Christian shouldn't do, and God might not let us see what happens. Because God wants to obey him because we read it in his word that we shouldn't do that. God might even let him prosper for a while so he won't repent 
So he won't ask for forgiveness. And then, and we're going to see that and we're going to have to decide, am I going to obey the Bible because of what the Bible says? Or am I going to obey the Bible because of circumstances? And that's where we show whether or not we have faith. And so, but unfortunately, because God doesn't bring the hammer down right away, people have this idea. It's never too late. There's always hope for mercy. And we're emboldening people to experiment with sin. And that's completely false. It is not true. There are people that are out there that are done for. They are too far gone. You know, and people get mad when preachers accuse people like Bruce Jenner of being reprobate. Listen, I'm sorry, man. There's no, there's no coming back for that guy. Okay. When you're doing what he's doing, promoting what he's promoting, mutilating your body, the, there's no coming back from that. And people are like, oh, no, no, we need to pray he gets saved. You know what you're telling everybody? Hey, boys, if you want to go turn yourself into a girl, you know, that it, it's, it's wrong, but you know, God would still save you. You could come back from that. No, listen. He did be an offer proven hard at his neck, so suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Let's not give them a false hope. Let's not encourage, let's terrify them from that type of life. Let's scare them from that, because there's some things you just don't come back from. The Bible says very clearly, Galatians 6, 7, 9, be not deceived. What's that talking about? Hey, there's going to be those preachers out there. They're going to tell you, hey, you can always come back. There's always a place to return. It's never too late. Hey, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall the spirit reap life everlasting. That can be scary. It can be good. If you're doing good, that's good. The Bible says, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Listen, if every time we did something good, look at verses, if every time we did something good, something great happened, then we would all be doing good things for the wrong reasons too, wouldn't we? If Brother John, we all saw Brother John, you know, every time he puts something in the offering, you know, he, he goes to the gas station afterwards and wins the lottery. We're all going to be given to God so we can go win the lottery. That's not, God doesn't want us doing it for that reason. God wants us obeying Him by faith. And people are they're, they're sending the wrong message. And so this, this, it's scary. The, the scariest part is we don't know where the line is. We don't know when we've crossed it. And it takes years for the consequences to come for disobedience sometimes. And since God you know, doesn't act immediately when we sin, it forces us to live by faith, which is exactly what God wants. It forces us to do that. And so God wants us to live by faith. And so if we're immediately punished every time, you know, then we're going to obey him just out of fear of suffering. We ought to want to please God. And, you know, chances are, if you willfully disobey God today, you won't suffer for it today. Go ahead. Whatever you're thinking about doing, go ahead and do it. I'll bet nothing will happen today. Most of us are. Have you ever done something you knew it was wrong and you were like just waiting for something to happen? You know, we're, you're, you're just, you're just, you're waiting. Like I'm, I'm afraid something's going to happen. You know, I'm skipping church. You, you skip church and you're driving real careful, aren't you? It's like, I'm, God's going to kill me in the car. No, he's not. That's not when he's going to do it. Because if we find out, you know, brother Lonnie played hooky from church and died in a car wreck. Now, none of us are going to play hooky from church anymore because we don't want to die in a car wreck, but God wants us going to church because he's told us to. That, that's what God wants. And so, yeah, go ahead, do your thing. You're not going to suffer for it today, but you might 10, 15, 20, 30 years later. That's scary right there. And so, you know what? I don't think I want to play around with sin. If the Holy Spirit's speaking to me, I think I'm going to listen. If the, you know, if I preach something and I get on one of the sins, that's God reproving you. He, how many times is God going to correct me? I don't know. He doesn't tell us. He just said being off. What's that? Five, six, seven, ten, twenty, thirty? I don't know. All I know is when you cross that line, you don't know you crossed it. And you know what? When I was studying for this, I thought, what's waiting for me? What kind of judgments are out there for me that from stuff I did maybe years ago that God hasn't punished me for yet? There could be some out there. I don't know. So you know what? While I can't do anything about what I've done in the past, 
I, at least from here on out, I can do right. And maybe if I do, if I get right now, maybe I'm right before that line. And God will show his mercy and God's not going to give me what I deserve. I don't, I don't know. If God's speaking to you about something right now, it's probably because you have not crossed the line. So you know what you need to do? You need to listen right now. And you won't get what you deserve. And that's my hope. You reap what you sow. And we're, we're always praying for crop failure there, aren't we? <laughs> and so I hope that was a hope to you. We can, we can push God too far. So with that, let's all stand together.